Amen. Have you ever done something for which you experienced sorrow? The aftermath of an act that you have committed that brings you grief and anguish. Maybe to the point where you wish that you could go back in time and change the course of your actions. But there you are in the moment of your misery, left to deal with the heartache that you are experiencing. And maybe you even try to express your remorse, but it doesn't really seem to truly convey the vexation of soul that you are dealing with. How many of us have been there? I know I have. I think it's safe to say that we've all probably had an experience along those lines at one time or another. See, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so we've all done some things for which we've experienced shame and guilt. Or what about this scenario? How many of us have struggled to overcome certain sinful behaviors in our lives? We go through the process of we commit a sinful act and we feel the guilt and the remorse that comes along with it. We go to God and we ask him for forgiveness and we ask him to help us to overcome that sin. But then at some time in the future, we find ourselves going back to that poison well and falling back into that same sin again. I've been there. It's not a pleasant predicament to find yourself in. But I praise God that in those moments, he has not left us without hope. See, praise God that he has provided for us a mechanism within the plan of salvation that gives us power divine power to correct our wrongs, to rebuild what we have broken, and to restore and reconcile our relationships. And that, brothers and sisters, is the gift of repentance. And notice I called it a gift of repentance. We will explore that concept a little bit later. But that's what today's topic is going to be. You see, repentance is a critical aspect of the salvific process and is a call that goes out to all of us. Turn with me to Mark chapter 1. And as we will see here, even before Jesus began his public ministry, his forerunner, John the Baptist, preached this message of repentance. Mark chapter 1 and we'll be looking at verses one through four. If you're there, say amen. amen. And reading it says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now turn with me over to Matthew chapter 3. And we'll see this again from Matthew's perspective. It's Matthew chapter 3. And we're looking at verses 1 and 2. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And reading it says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So prior to Jesus beginning his public ministry, this is a message that was being preached to the people. Now we fast forward when Jesus began his ministry. We, since we're already here in Matthew, let's go over to chapter 4. Now we know the story and the progression. John is preaching. Jesus comes. He's baptized. And in the beginning of chapter 4, he goes into the wilderness to be tempted. But we'll pick up the narrative in chapter 4 of Matthew in verse 12. 
And it says, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zabulon and Nephthalim that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zabulon and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee, or Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. In verse 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now go with me to the book of Acts, chapter 2. After Jesus' death and resurrection and his ascension, this message of repentance was preached by his apostles in the early Christian church. Acts chapter 2, and we, we know that story as well, I'm sure, that The disciples were up in that upper room awaiting for the power of the Holy Spirit to fall upon them. And then when it did, Peter, he preached a powerful sermon. And so powerful, in fact, we'll pick up the narrative in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. And it says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter, And to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We move forward to chapter 3 of Acts in verse 19, Peter again gives this admonition. He says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. This subject was even a, a, a part of Paul's preaching ministry. You go to Acts chapter 17, we find Paul in Athens and he is just began to preach, and he's talking about this altar that he had seen erected to the unknown God. And as Paul began to preach about this unknown God to those there in Athens, and he talks about how they may not have known him before, but now they have this opportunity to know him. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30, he says, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. You see, it doesn't matter if we were ignorant in our sin for behavior or not, the call goes out to each and every one of us that we need to repent. Go with me to Revelation chapter two, verse, or chapter, chapters two and three. We're gonna look at a few texts here. We, if you are familiar with These chapters, these are the seven letters to the seven churches. And we know that these seven letters to these seven churches represent periods of church history. And throughout these messages, Jesus is calling these churches to repent. There are only two churches that don't have this this admonition to repent, and that's the church of Smyrna and Philadelphia, but these are the two churches that Christ has nothing bad to say about them. You know, Smyrna, they were being persecuted for their faith. They were giving their lives for their faith. And Philadelphia, they were doing what God had asked them to do. So he had nothing bad to say about them. There was no need for them to repent. But we can, as we see in the other five churches, with Ephesus in, in chapter 2, verse 5, Jesus says, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent. And do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Go down to verse 16 in the message to Pergamos. Jesus says, Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. To Thyatira in verses 21 and 22 of chapter 2. 
He says, and I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And then Sardis in Revelation 3, verse 3 says, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. And then down to the last day church, the church period that we find ourselves in, the church of Laodicea. In verse 19 of chapter 3. Jesus says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So as we can see all throughout the history of the church, all throughout the history of the world even, because we can, as we're going to look at some texts, even in the Old Testament times, the call to repent has been given. Ever since sin has been in the world, that has been the given remedy for sin, is to repent. But the question that I have for us is, do we really understand what repentance is? Or better yet, should I say, do we really understand what true biblical repentance is? And if we know what it is, have we individually experienced that type of repentance in our lives? You know, it's a good thing that we understand what sin is. It's transgression of God's law. It's a good thing that we recognize that we are all sinners and in need of a Savior. It's a good thing to realize that God has made the gift of salvation accessible and available to each and every one of us free of charge. But do we truly understand the steps we must take in order to obtain it? Have we truly entered into the righteous path to walk in newness of life? And I emphasize that part, newness of life, walking in newness of life. You see, as Peter said in Acts, we must repent and be converted. What does that mean? That's what we're going to talk about today. Go with me back to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And we're going to look at the first part of verse 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And, and I would suggest if you have a bookmark or something, put it in there because we'll be coming back to this even as we move around the Bible a little bit this morning. But 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9, Paul says, he says, Now I rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. You see, I think that there is a, an issue sometimes with Christians in concerning the idea of repentance. And I think, and I know that I've experienced it in my own life, but sometimes we tend to equate the sorrow that we are feeling with repentance. And we feel that because we are feeling grieved, because we are remorseful, that, that, we, that means that is evidence that we are repentant. But that's not necessarily the case, so we want to look at what the Bible has to say about repentance. Because as Isaiah 8.20 says, to the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So we want to make sure that we understand what God's word says about this subject. Amen? So turn with me to the book of Ezekiel. We're going to look at a couple of texts in Ezekiel, and we're going to start in Ezekiel chapter 14. What does the Bible have to say about true repentance, this repentance that leads to salvation? Ezekiel chapter 14, and we're going to look at verse 6. If you're there, please let me know by saying amen. Amen. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 6, and it says, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces 
from all your abominations. Repent and turn. Now, interestingly enough, when you go back and you look at the Hebrew word that is translated here in this text as repent, it's the exact same word that is also translated turn. So it could have been translated, thus saith the Lord God, turn and turn from your, yourselves from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. You see, true repentance involves a turning away, a change of course, going in a different direction. Go over to Ezekiel 18, and we're going to look at verses 30 through 32. And I think this will make it a little bit, it, uh, it'll give us even more clarity on this idea of true biblical repentance. Ezekiel 18, 30 through 32, which says, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourself from all your what? All your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. 31, cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed. And then pay attention to this part right here. It says, and make you a new what? A new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. A new heart. That's part of the repentance process. If we are going to turn away from the sins that we commit, the sinful behaviors that we engage in, the only way to be able to do that is to have a new heart placed within us. And that only happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, we're told in the Bible that our hearts are sinful, that they are wicked, and deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, and that we don't even know our own hearts. And if we think that somehow, some way, we can engage in true biblical repentance in and of our own strength, we are deceiving ourselves. Now, interestingly, about as I was studying this idea of repentance and I was going through and, and just looking at texts about repentance and how the word is used, I came across something interesting. And I would like to share with you and suggest that if you want to enhance your Bible study experience, it's a good idea to go back and look at the original language at times. Because there you can get a better understanding of the, the original intent of the author's uh, meaning when, as he was writing the words that he wrote and the words that he chose to use. But what I found is that in both the Greek and in the Hebrew, there are two words in each language that are translated into the English as repent. And for both the Greek and the Hebrew, one of the words that's translated to, as repent simply uh, gives this, this idea of regret or remorse or sorrow. So it's, it's not easy to, I mean, it's not hard to see why that may be a problem amongst some of God's people that they just equate repentance with feelings of sorrow. But the other word also donate, uh, has this connotation of turning, of changing course. And that is the true repentance that God expects for his people to engage in. Because that is part of the process of sanctification. It's the beginning process of sanctification. And we know that sanctification involves us having the image of God recreated in us. Perfecting our character so that the character of Christ is in us. So that we can be worthy to stand before him. But one of the things that I found also that was interesting, that for the Hebrew word that is translated as, that has the connotation of regret or remorse or sorrow, it's translated 41 times in the Old Testament as the word repent. But 57 times that same word is translated comfort. 
And as I began to think about that, you know, the Lord hit me with this, and, and, and I began to ask myself, how many times when I engaged in what I thought was repentance, or when I ha- expressed my remorse and I re- apologized it or for something that I had done, how many times was that simply for my own comfort? How many times did I repent or seemingly repent in my mind simply because I no longer wanted to feel the feelings of guilt and shame that I was feeling. I didn't have the actual desire to change my life and to change my behavior, and that was evident because in the future I did the same thing that I had once said that I was sorry for. But in that moment of apology, I felt better about myself because the person accepted my apology and told me that they forgave me. But brothers and sisters, that is not the kind of repentance that leads to salvation. But where does repentance come from? Where does true repentance come from? Remember I said that it was a gift. Turn with me to Acts chapter 5, verses 30 and 31. And I want us to see from the Bible where this repentance comes from talked about how it it doesn't come from inside of ourselves, but it indeed is a gift. And here is the scripture that will give us the evidence of that. Acts chapter 5, verses 30 and 31. If you have it, say amen. And it says, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give what? Repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. So that repentance that leads to salvation does not come from us. It's given to us by Jesus through the power of his Holy Spirit. It's not something that we have the capacity in and of ourselves to bring out. We must receive it from the Lord. But how can we tell if our repentance experience is indeed genuine? Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And I want us to see this. Because when I saw this and when I understood this, this, it just turned a light on in my mind and it, it just changed my whole perspective. But I'm going to start back in verse 9 again. I'm going to read through it, but we're going to add to it verse 11 this time. It says, Now I rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry, sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And then verse 11, For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you! Yea, what clearing of yourselves! Yea, what indignation! Yea, what fear! Yea, what vehement desire! Yea, what zeal! Yea, what revenge! In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. He says, what carefulness it wrought in you. So when we are truly experiencing this godly sorrow that leads us to this true repentance that leads to salvation, there is something that happens inside of us and we become more careful. You know, as I was thinking about how when I got into recovery and I had made a choice and decided that I wanted to stop drinking alcohol for good, there were some things that I had to do. There were some changes that I had to make. I had to be careful in in who I hung out with. I had to stop hanging around with certain people because that was what we would do. We would get together and we would drink. So if I was going to not fall into that temptation, then, then I couldn't hang around with them anymore. I had to stop going to certain places because I knew that the temptation would be present for me to fall back into that lifestyle that I was trying to run away from. You see, when we think of the sins that we commit, we have to examine our lives and we have to examine the things that, that we, the circumstances, the, the people that we uh, deal with, the, uh, 
uh, things that we may use to that facilitate that sinful behavior. And for some of us, it may be it may be that we need to distance ourselves from those things, at least for a time until we develop a, a, a strength to resist that temptation. You know, fortunately for me, I've been doing recovery for over eight years by the grace of God, and, and so some of those things that I had to distance myself from in the beginning, I, I don't necessarily have to anymore. Some of those people I can hang out with, but one thing about when you just start doing right, then sometimes that causes those people to distance themselves from you. But if we are going to be successful in our salvific process, if we are truly going to find ourselves in that realm of repentance that leads to salvation, we must, the evidence of that we have entered into that realm is that we begin to be more careful in the way that we conduct ourselves. You know, one illustration that I thought of, I thought of a, a husband who forgets his anniversary. You know, and as I was thinking about it, I pictured this man and his wife, they wake up on the morning of the anniversary and, you know, he's so busy with the things going on in his life that that he, it slips his mind. He hasn't thought about it. He's forgotten. He gets up, he leaves house and goes to work, goes through his day, not thinking about it. But then he comes home and his wife is there And she's prepared this spectacular dinner to celebrate their anniversary. She's sent the children off to spend the night at grandma so that they can just have some time together. And he walks in the door, he smells this delicious meal and it's his favorite food cooking. And she sits him down and she brings him in this heaping plate of food and sets it in front of him and says, happy anniversary, honey. And at that time it comes back to him and he's just shamed because he has forgotten. And when his wife looks and sees the look on his face, she realizes what's going on. She understands that he's forgotten and and she's visibly hurt. And she asks him, how could you have forgotten our anniversary? Now there's nothing that this brother can do in that moment to fix that situation. But question, how careful do you think that he will be in the future to ensure that he does not forget that day again. I picture him setting all kinds of of reminders in his calendar, one for the day of and the day before and three days out and a week out, but he's going to make sure, he's going to do what is necessary to ensure that he does not forget that day again because he realizes how hurt his wife was as a result of that. And that's not what he wants to do because he loves his wife. When we contemplate the sins that we commit, we must understand that it's our sins that put Jesus on the cross. And every time that we commit a sin, it's like driving that nail into his hands or into his feet or taking that spear and thrusting it into his side. Every time we commit a sin, we crucify Christ afresh. But when we love God, when we love Jesus, and we accept the sacrifice that he has made for our lives, we don't want to do that. But where do we begin? How can we start to make this goal of true repentance a reality in our lives? Go with me to Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah is the next to last book of the Old Testament. So if you need help finding it, just go to Matthew and then go back two books. You'll go to Malachi, then Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 12, and we're going to look at verses 9 and 10. Zechariah chapter 12, looking at verses 9 and 10. And reading it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him 
as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. If we want to begin to experience this, this godly sorrow that leads to repentance unto salvation, we need to behold the sufferings of Christ. We need to look upon him whom we have pierced by our sins. In Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 374, Ellen White gives us this counsel. She says, it will do you good and our ministers generally to frequently review the closing scenes in the life of our Redeemer. Here, beset with temptations as he was, we may all learn lessons of the utmost importance to us. It would be well to spend a thoughtful hour each day reviewing the life of Christ from the manger to Calvary. We should take it point by point and let the imagination vividly grasp each scene, especially the closing ones of his earthly life. By thus contemplating his teachings and sufferings and the infinite sacrifice made by him for the redemption of the race, we may strengthen our faith, quicken our love, and become more deeply imbued with the spirit which sustained our Savior. If we would be saved at last, we must all learn the lesson of penitence and faith at the foot of the cross. That's something for us to consider. You know, how often do we spend time reflecting upon what Jesus did for us? You know, I, I, as I was preparing this sermon and I, I came across this quote, you know, I remembered years ago that I had heard a, a pastor uh, make this suggestion and then I, I went back and I started doing it here and I plan to continue doing it. But one thing that, that you can do if you want to reflect on the sufferings of Christ, there's six Bible passages that, that deal with the, that time frame, that end time of Christ's life that I have been looking at. And just as for your, if you want to write them down or you can see me after it, I can give them to you again. But Psalm 22, it's the Messianic Psalm. And a lot of the words that Jesus said while he was on the cross are found in that psalm. That's one passage. Then there's Isaiah 52, 13, through all the way to 53, 12. And I had the privilege of, of dealing with that passage in the Sabbath school lesson that I taught a, a few weeks ago. But that deals with the sufferings of the Messiah. And then there's the, the gospel accounts of Jesus' final uh, hours and, and what I take it is from Gethsemane all the way up until he dies on the cross. And so in Matthew, that's Matthew 26, 30 through 27, 59. In Mark, that's Mark 14, 32 through 15, 39. In Luke, it's Luke 22, 39 to 23, 49. And then in John, it's chapters 18 and 19. But one thing that I've noticed is that the more that I behold the sufferings of Christ, the more I see the wretchedness of my own sin and the more that I have a desire to distance myself from that sin, to turn from my sin. You know, we, had, we were talking about sin and how it separates us from God in Sabbath school this morning. And the insight that I'm going to share it again, but it was something that the Lord just put, to me, put on me right there on the seat. But as we think of this great controversy, we could put... Sin, and we can put righteousness on either side of a line. And we ourselves, we find ourselves in the middle. And as we face away from God, that, lead, that leaves us facing towards sin. And that will not allow us to achieve salvation. But if we want to achieve salvation, we have to turn and face the Lord and face God. And that will cause us to put our backs to sin. And this is what we must accomplish by the grace of God in our lives. Now, in closing, I want to look at two examples. One of repentance that leads the, to death and one of the type of repentance that leads to salvation and life. And we can find these two examples as members of the 12 disciples that walked with Jesus for three and a half years. 
So we'll start with, so that we can end on a good note, we'll start with the, the, the disciple who had a moment of repentance, but it led to death. And that's in the life of Judas. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 27, and we're going to look at verses 3 through 5. Now we know the situation with Judas, that he betrayed the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. And he led the Jewish authorities to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane so that they could arrest him. But in Matthew 27, verses 3 through 5, we see Judas's repentance experience, if you will. And if you're there, say amen. And it says there in verse 3, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And does not the Bible say that he was repentant? But it was not the kind of repentance that leads to salvation. You see, with Judas, he was, he was sorry. He was remorseful for what he had done. But he was remorseful because of the consequences. You notice that he says that he, that as he uh, comes back into the, to the temple, he says, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. So he acknowledges his sin. But what he is really feeling is the effect, because in the Mosaic law, if you go to Deuteronomy 27, 25, it, there's a curse that is pronounced on anyone who would take a reward to slay an innocent person. And I'm certain that Judas understood that and he knew that and he's feeling the weight of his actions, he's feeling the curse upon him and he is remorseful, not for the fact that he has caused this harm to come upon Jesus, but simply because he is suffering the consequences of his actions. That is the repentance, that is the sorrow of the world that leads to death. And that is not the, the kind of sorrow, that is not the type of repentance that we are after as members of the body of Christ. So now let's look at another disciple's situation. We're going to look at Peter's uh, situation. Go with me to Luke chapter 22. And we're going to look at verses 54 through 62. And it's a well-known story. We know that before... Uh, Jesus was arrested that he had told Peter that he would deny him three times before the cock crew. But Peter, in his pride and arrogance, he was saying, no, no, Jesus, not me. These other brothers here, they might do that, but not me. But we pick up the narrative of the story in Luke chapter 22, verses 50, in verse 54. And it says, Then took they and led him and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after, another confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth this fellow was also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he yet spake, the cock crew. And look at this in, in verse six, verses 61 and 62. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. In the aftermath of Peter's sin, he beheld Christ. And I can only imagine, 
as Christ turned to look at Peter and Peter made eye contact with him, you know, the, the look that Jesus had on his face, it was not a look of condemnation. It was not a look that said, didn't I tell you, Peter, what's the matter with you? But I pictured it was a, love, it was a, a look of love, of compassion, of pity, and of forgiveness. And as Peter looked upon the Savior and he recognized his predicament, he realized his sin, the Bible tells us that he went out and wept bitterly. Now we know that that was indeed an experience of sorrow for Peter that led to repentance unto salvation. How do we know that? Because we have it in the account as the church began to get on its feet in the early days after the day of Pentecost, Peter was one of the boldest ones out there proclaiming the message of truth. He would not deny his Lord ever again because he had been there and done that, but he had received that gift of true repentance that leads to salvation. Brothers and sisters, as we contemplate our own lives and we contemplate our own stories and predicaments and situations, I pray that we will examine ourselves and see if the, the kind of repentance that we are engaging ourselves in, if it lines up with what the Bible says is true repentance. It's the type of repentance that will lead us to turn away from sin. It's the, the type of repentance that will lead us to the throne of grace, to ask for that divine assistance to help us, to change us on the inside. It's the type of repentance that would have David asking God to create in him a clean heart and to renew a right spirit within him. As we look around of what's going on in the world, we know that the coming of Jesus is soon to come. And as Peter counseled us, we must make our calling and election sure. We must be diligent and we must be careful to ensure that we are walking in the paths of righteousness. I pray that as we consider what we have heard this morning, that it will be a blessing to us and, and it will be something that we can hold on to. And if there are changes that we need to make in our own lives, let us boldly go before the throne of grace, where we are promised that if when we do so, that we can find grace to help in time of need. Let's pray. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. And we thank you for the ability to be able to go to your word to get clarification on the topics that are important to our salvation. And I pray, Lord, that as we consider what we've heard this morning about repentance, I pray that we will, in, that we will strive diligently to ensure that the repentance that we engage in is that true repentance that is received as a gift from you. Help us, Lord, as we go forward uh, through this day and through this next week, help us, Lord, to take time to contemplate what you have done for us, the suffering that you endured on our behalf so that we might have a right to the tree of life and to eternal life. And may that help us, Lord, to have an earnest desire to separate ourselves from sin, to turn from sin, and keep our face directed toward you. Bless us as we leave this place, but help us to remember that it is never from your presence. I pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.